You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no-duh on the internet. I remember when COVID was sort of uh, booming, like when, when the, the numbers were as bad as they could be, I saw that like 30% of small businesses had shuttered their doors and that so many companies were slumping. And now the economy is catching up to that. Like a lot of people think that the war in the Ukraine is causing the economy to immediately have inflation and immediately slump. But inflation was starting before that and the economy was collapsing kind of before that. So what I'm wondering is, how are CEOs doing so damn well? Like you said, something just blew my mind, which is, um, you know, CEOs in the top echelon of, you know, wealthy people were 55% more rich since COVID started, which, um, right. what's, what's the old phrase? The, the best time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Yeah. It's the best time to buy when, when everyone's, yeah, and a lot of great business have started during recessions and depressions. It's like, well, how could that be, right? When less people are buying things, how could that be? Things are cheaper. Doing some study about that, um, it actually goes back to the Great Depression. Um, and, you, you know, everyone knows when the stock market had that big crash, uh, millionaires were no longer millionaires on paper anymore. and They were jumping out of buildings to their death, right? Right. Um, stocks were worth absolutely nothing. So back in the Great Depression in the, you know, was it the, thir- the late 20s and 30s, right? Um, the CEOs, they, they got a plan. And their company was not, their stock and their company was worth nothing. So what they started doing was they started to buy their own company's stock. Doesn't that sound crazy to you, Joe? So in, in stock terms, they're buying their own shares back, their own stock back. That'd be like me being like, I, I produce cutlery and like forks. I put out a bunch of forks, and then I'm like, well, now my forks are worthless. I'll just go out and buy back some of those forks. Like, that sounds insane. Like, that's, that's a sounds like a mental right. Uh, you say I, I would want to get out. I would want to retire. I'd probably steal some as much as I could and get out of there. Right. Right. Exactly. But but what but what these wise, shrewd business people knew was that when you have less of something, it's worth what more, Joe? It's worth more. It's more valuable. So to make the company stock more valuable. There was less of it to buy. So they, they, they had a plan. And this is how a lot of companies, you know, a lot of big companies in America survived the Great Depression. But then the Law, Security, and Exchange Act came in, and that came in in 1931. And it's by our favorite president, Mr. FDR himself. Okay. He, he saw this going on and saw it as the shady thing that it was and said, this can go on no longer. So after that, when companies got pro- got more profits, what they had to do is they had to invest in something. They had to develop new products, right? New F- new um, product and development, or they had to raise wages put towards their 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 people, right? Invest in their laborers, or they could just pay dividends to the investors. Could we could we pause on that just for a second because that is such a extraordinarily important part that you said. It, the, traditionally, the, the dream of Ayn Rand and objectivism and economists and, and capitalists, just everybody who, who likes money, the, the ideal is if your company does well, then you invest in people and in um, innovation. Like you, you, you make more tech. Uh, you, you make reared in metal. You, you make, you know, uh, a new something. Uh, you make shinier light bulbs. You, you do something that will benefit all of humanity by being uh, selfish enough to have a corporation. So that's the dream. And so are, you're saying that they, they came up with, we'll just buy back our own stocks to shrink the stocks that are available out there, but it makes our shareholders not want to go away. Like it, it means that their and stocks still stay valuable so they don't leave us. So It was that way. Am I getting that right? And then FDR came in and put this in and said, you can't do that anymore. You, ha- you have to put the money towards these, one of these three buckets. So it has to be a dividends back, so which is out, which is money out, 
you can't just you just can't ingest it. You can't just keep regurgitating it. <laughs> it's in cellular terms. That's called autophagy. Like it's self eating. <laughs> that's a big word. You are. <laughs> you always wow me with this. So when they went into this, so and you made a great point about the tech improving your products, making them more valuable, making them more useful, right? So what happened with technology and productivity went up. Well, wages also went up because they were using this FDR model, this SEC bot model. And so that made a thriving middle class for over 30 years. And that's when America really boomed because the middle class came up and started buying cars and houses and washing machines. And then in 1981, Ronald Reagan had a new SEC chair called um, John Shad. And he brought buybacks back. So buybacks were in business in the during the Depression and before the Depression. And then they had a vacation legally and then they brought them back and they said CEOs can buy back they can bring that back and so what that meant though on this new buyback was CEOs got used to get paid on how their company does how profitable their company is but what changed when the new SEC in the 80s was they got paid bonuses on what their stock was worth not how much the company was worth does that make sense it it makes a twisted sense. It like that. Not yeah. The stock. I guess the stock value is is the company's value, but not on how much money they were making. Just on the value of the stock. Right. You, you can. <laughs> Maybe you clean that up. You can me. have a company that is like inventing new things, making the world a better place, expanding. Even if you just look at it, business like they. And they're, and they're losing they're, money. On they're losing paper, money. Their stocks are, money. are not worth as much, and they're losing money. But then you have a CEO who, like, they're not putting out – they're blockbuster. They're not putting out anything new. They're dying on the market. You know, everything is going wrong for them. And the CEO just takes stocks off the market. They do buybacks. And it it makes it, it – it makes their stocks more valuable. And that's what the CEO's pay is based on. Like, like he's like, oh, our stocks are still worth a lot, blockbuster. But so, – so pay me. Give me my bonus because our stocks are worth a lot. Big oil companies offering investors uh, stock buybacks and dividends. Talking about ExxonMobil, we're talking about Chevron. Both of them are seeing huge profits. Do they take that windfall of billions of dollars and dedicate it to finding new sources of oil, new sources of natural gas to try to ease the sticker shock at the pump for consumers? Or do they buy up their own stocks, thus having fewer stocks in circulation, thus enriching shareholders and executives? I'll give you one guess which way they're going. Yep, stock buybacks. Ridiculous bonuses. And one of the best examples of it is in the automobile business, um, auto manufacturing. Um, and this is taken from a, um, from 2008, where this is just very, very, very um, obvious. Um, General Motors was worth $22 million and comparably Volkswagen $12 million and Toyota $3 million. So they started all these buybacks. So General Motors was way in the lead. Um, but General Motors was not reinvesting in its employees and its plant. And they were making record. The CEO was making huge money. And they went from number four, of number one, all the way down to number four. Holy shit. And it didn't make any sense. Yeah. So, and the, the collateral fallout from that is, is it, the automobile businesses does not, let's say in America, the big three, it doesn't just affect them, it affects all their subcontractors, all the people who make their transmissions, all the people who make their windshields, all that stuff. So they were decimating all the towns, a whole, whole communities. Um, and some of these big um, auto towns, uh, when they closed down these shops, you know, General, General Motors is the only show in town. So there's schools that are are not opening, and there's schools that are closing, hospitals that are going out of business because everyone packs up and moves out and goes to find a new job. Holy, so damn. So if I am a, but if I'm if I'm a shareholder, if I'm sitting around the board, uh, the you know the board table, uh, I don't see the town that got shut down around the company that's failing. What I see on paper is. My shares were worth a hundred and thirty dollars, you know, last year. They're worth a hundred and thirty this year, and the CEO just got his bonus, and everything is copacetic. Like my my portfolio doesn't change, or it's even better, because the stocks got bought back. So who cares? 
It does seem like the big short, like it's just a matter of time before this collapses, right? Right. Well, for the for that company, I mean, I mean, we were just talking about Chipotle. I mean, like this makes sense now why Chipotle can lose a couple of locations and one of them is staffed by one poor teenager during COVID and one guy in the back doing, you know, washing dishes. And you're like, how are they open? And how is the CEO getting even bigger bonuses this year? And it's like, oh, okay, now this kind of clicks. So I guess the the next big part is how many companies are doing this like <laughs> like the the let's go back to the the s p 500 um on that index 255 of those companies reward executives at least in part by their earnings per share so like of the 500 index more than half by a little bit is doing this that's insane <laughs> like that's that's an american economy based on you know, uh, at, at least if not incentivizing or allowing stock buybacks, it's just there on the table. Like it's it's at least an option for them. I just, you, you have to wonder if this what is the greed? I, I guess it's this royalty, and you get callous to things. But how could you take a fifty-five million dollar payday when you're already wealthy? You're already successful. I mean, I mean, how many yachts can you buy, and how many Ferraris, and how many jets, and? Your family's set for life already. How could you close down whole towns of blue-collar, hardworking people and engineers and all these people and not have some sort of... I just, I mean, how could you go to sleep and sleep like a baby on your 10,000 thread count? Right. <laughs> Gold-plated, I don't know. And it's not just about the greed. If we're looking at it from a capitalist perspective, per share does not mean your product is worth more on the market. If you remove a bunch of stock from the market, suddenly your shares, quote unquote, earn more. But that's that's doesn't mean you have anything out there that is, you know, uh, worth value to anyone. It just means that you have moved the money around in a very clever way. And doesn't that collapse? Isn't that isn't that just a car? Oh, it trick? does. Yeah. Um, there's 28 percent of the um, according to Reuters, 28 percent of the companies on the S&P. They use something other than per share metrics. Uh which can still be influenced by buybacks. It's not that they got away from them, but there are some companies that are pledging to not do this. Like it's not, uh, we, we did not just break this as a news story to America. Economists know about this. In fact, there's probably economists listening to this who are like, this is just listening to two rubes realize how screwed we are. <laughs> like they're just like, like yeah, baby's first economy book, but it's this is this is first grade yeah 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 yeah, no shit but (laughs) but like the pepsi ceo has pledged to phase out uh, corporate buybacks entirely like they they i think they said that their their stock purchase spending will plunge to almost zero uh after reaching three billion in 2019 and dipping past two billion last year they said they said quote we do not expect to repurchase any additional shares for the balance of 2021 and that's from pepsi so like there are companies that totally get that this is unhelpful to the economy, unhelpful to their workers. Like it, it only really enriches shareholders and CEO. Um, and so like not only can the economy not handle our theoretical, everyone's a CEO base salary, but it's already in a state of sort of slumping and collapse from CEOs who are currently sacrificing company growth for buybacks. And this isn't, by the way, I know our uh, episodes lately have gotten a little bit hot as far as politics go. This is not in a political opinion. This isn't like like we mentioned uh, Reagan era um, politics and like FDR. Um, currently in today's politics, uh, both Marco Rubio and Elizabeth Warren have worked on different ways to disincentivize buybacks. So it doesn't matter what part of the aisle you're on <laughs> unless you are basically insider trading while you're in politics you you understand that this is not good for the economy do you think some of those powerful politicians whether red or blue are a little jealous they don't want the it's like you know (laughs) they don't want them to have that much power that much money it's like hey you guys need to stay at least under us kind of the neighbor thing i remember um uh, somebody publicly asked nancy pelosi after she um made a bunch of money during covid because she was able to pull her stocks right before the um, the initial wave of COVID hit. Somebody asked, the, asked her if um, politicians should be allowed to even participate in the stock market. And she totally dodged the question like she was in the Matrix. So <laughs> I... I know that politicians make it. I said that. I did the visual of an aging woman doing yeah. that, and it just kind of made me laugh. <laughs> that was a good. That was a good right. visual. <laughs> 
So uh. I've probably talked about this guy, but have I talked to you about, um, I went to a Toastmasters meeting with a, a really like a, a fun guy. His name is um, Ricky. And if you're listening to this, um, I hope this isn't too embarrassing, but um, he, he came to club and like he, he really wanted to learn how to public speak and he really wanted to talk about like, you know, like get better at, at motivational speaking and, and just communicating in general. And when asked about his goal, he said it was to be a millionaire. And like, that's not a bad goal. I don't disagree with that. But when asked what he liked doing, like what his passions were, blank. Like, like he, he didn't really have one. And so that's that's my question is I just want to I just want to have a Land Rover kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he he mentioned uh, having uh, specifically almost cliche model wives, and um, we had a couple of giggles from the audience. But like, he was serious. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's kind of like confidence will get you all those things, but you need to be confident about something. Right. You gotta <laughs> you gotta do the work. You gotta pick a lane and 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 do and build something in it. Right. That is that is what I see CEOs doing is they pick a lane and they get extraordinarily knowledgeable and good at it uh, along with having a great team a great mentality and a great work ethic the ones that really make a lot of money they they really are working for it and a lot of it is committing themselves to a passion and knowledge of that passion so that's my next question for you Todd is um, were you ever given the marshmallow test when you were a kid the marshmallow test now what is that so this has become an old standard in psychology. I'm not, we will link to the original marshmallow test, but basically the idea is um, you give a toddler, I think they, they're four years old, you put a marshmallow in front of them and you leave the room and you tell them if this marshmallow is here in 10 minutes when we get back, uh, if you can wait that long, you get another marshmallow. You get to eat two instead of just the one. So they're incentivized to have delayed gratification. The reason why this test has become so popular is they followed up on kids who were given this test and they found out that kids who could delay gratification, who could avoid eating the marshmallow and wait for two marshmallows instead of just the one right now, they lived happier lives. They had investment portfolios. They, they you know, led better, better um, career lives. Like, like it, it turns out that if you can That's delay crazy. gratification from when they when were four, small. That's crazy. Yeah. It may- yeah, it makes total sense, though, doesn't it? Because that's how life is. You plant seeds and then you harvest. The more you're willing to plant and wait. Right. So, <laughs> and we see this with the people who are educated, right? They, they they pay and pay and pay and invest, 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 and then they reap the benefits. Exactly. Later. And this is a common enough test to where I, like anyone who's been to a shrink's office with a four-year-old, they probably have had it happen. So my question is, did, did you ever, your, your mother's an educator, did you ever take the marshmallow test? And I'm wondering, did you succeed at it? I I did. I'm sure I did, and I don't remember it, and I haven't spoken to my mother about it, but I guarantee I'd been one of them that would have ate the thing right away as, a, <laughs> as an alcoholic addict that I am and as an over-emotional, dopamine-craving, a <laughs> little bit chubby. Yeah, <laughs> There's no way a young time. I, yeah, I wouldn't have taken that. What about you, Joe? I bet you, I bet you are. You, you could hold off. You have the willpower and you have the... You're a tomorrow kind of guy. I I am, but I'm. Th- they have a, a subclass of kids in these studies who are able to delay gratification, but they do it basically through distraction t- strategy. Like they lick the marshmallow, or they stare at it, or like they they go under the table and hide from it. They they do something. I'm not a willpower person. They turn it into yeah, a booger. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm not a willpower person. I'm a distraction <laughs> person. So I I may have passed it by doing that, but. I'm insulted that you even asked me that question. I hope that was for the show. You know I eat that marshmallow. You've seen how I eat, drink, whatever, how I do everything. That's why I leave snacks on the table. Without thinking. I do it without any kind of consequences. Well, it's yeah. it's funny because uh, 30% of kids are not able to um, t- to delay gratification. they got to eat it, which is funny because 25% of Americans right now have no retirement savings. And only about thirty percent feel on track. So, like, this is not correlation or causation, but I just think it's amusing that thirty percent of all people can't delay gratification, and about thirty percent of people don't have savings or <laughs> retirement saved up. So that was 
couple. Well, I have a couple. I have a couple sayings, mantras I've lived by, and one of them was, "It's not going to matter 100 years from now," which is a, a right now kind of thing. And you don't want to go to Europe when you're 80, right? You know, That's which true. is it's, it's kind of the old smoke them if you smoke them if you got them. You know, it's, it's an excuse to be irresponsible. Yeah. <laughs> to quote a rap song, "I don't want my best dressed day to be when I'm in a casket." <laughs> so, um, now, okay, so if. If there's 30% of people who can't delay gratification and and smoke their retirement savings while they got them, about 30%, like about the same amount, think that they're doing great, like their their career and their retirement is on track. So if we're just talking about can everybody be a CEO, we're just going to go with the very simplest, lowest bar of do you have the delayed gratification mentality to be a CEO? And so we can just quietly eliminate 60% of the population from being a CEO just purely based on temperament and delayed gratification. So I'm going to just yeah, cut them out. Just cut them out. Throw those away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause it takes a long time. It really does. Right. Unless you're like a Ford, you're born into a, you're born into a family of, <laughs> we're going to take those out of it too. Right. <laughs> I will say though, I've, I've seen a lot of CEOs where like they delay gratification long enough to get their education and to get, their career started to start really making money and then they go freaking crazy like like we were talking yachts earlier and like i mean the more we talk between you mentioning yachts and all those crazy purchases it is sounding more and more like america has oligarchs like we're an oligarchy not a democracy especially if you take in that princeton study that we were talking about where you know the the general public does not get what they want voted on it's actually you know lobbyists and and people with money like the again we'll link off to that princeton study just because i think it's so important but can we talk about the crazy spending of some of these tech billionaires because they i've heard of so many of them doing bunkers like like there's a show uh like like there's a tlc show i think or a discovery show about rich people in their bunkers <laughs> They're amazing, and then there's there's manufacturers all over this country, and and the people, their name clients are are these billionaires. They got lawyers, they got doctors, they got all kinds of people who are you know CEOs. People are talking about high earners, high achievers, and they have these bunkers. And what do you th you think they're worried about? Um, you think they're worried about the next world war? Or, or pollution. Why do you think they're hiding these bunkers? I personally so? think they're worried about the French Revolution. I think they are worried about. We're creating so many lower. They're worried yeah, about that, that the lower class is going to rise up yeah, and try to guillotine them. You're absolutely right. No, really. That, and they they want to they, and they're absolutely afraid of just civil unrest. Oh my god! And so they have these special hatches. So that, so they hire these contractors who, and a, one of the contractors I was reading through all these different articles. And one contractor saying, you know, I'd rather do stuff above ground. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's just so you can't see it; it's hidden. You can't brag about it. You can't put it in your advertising. They have all these secret ways and different locks, and then you go under these. Some of these things they have one that's called it. It's about four point two million dollars. It's called the presidential bunker, and uh, you know it's it's not your it's not your idea of a hole in the ground. It's six thousand square feet, six bedrooms, two kitchens, got a gym, a shooting range. All of them have bowling alleys, Joe. And it's to keep us, the lower class, out from going down there and cutting their heads off. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Having sex with their corpses. I mean, how afraid of us are could they possibly be? We're tired from working all day at Chipotle. <laughs> I was kind of joking about the, the guillotines thing, but that's crazy. I mean, like, like it's, it's not, you know, uh, the sun baking everybody and turning us into Mad Max. It really is just civil unrest. That is so wild. Uh, some of them have greenhouses in them, Joe. Greenhouses underground. <laughs> it, the the electrician that's that what's involved in this is it's just crazy, and, and you could just see if we if we were in that social class, we'd go and get a tour. We'd show off ours, and then it, the 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 other you know the other CEO from from the other company would have a bigger one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we wouldn't show it to everybody. We only have special people clean it, and I mean, it's just crazy. It's it's just so stupid. Instead of lowering rent on the properties that they are renting out to uh, us poor serfs, they'll spend that money on a bunker so they can escape us poor serfs when they when it comes time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the poor serfs are the one cleaning the right. place, right? I mean, come on. Yeah, I, that's that's the fun part is 
all these people building presidential bunkers, they're not killing the contractors. Like they're going to have a lot of contractors who know where these bunkers are. So when they when now what's what's funny about it when you go down and you do tours of them, and I, I watched a lot of them, you know, online and stuff. Never even heard of this before. Didn't know it was a thing. I know about bunkers, but they weren't the ones I thought of. You know, the hunkered down with the can of beans. These places are heated floors, beautifully framed. And then, you know, they take down the stuff they love, which is expensive artwork. So they're putting, burying that in the ground. Ferraris. I mean, they don't, it's not that they just want to hide. They want to hide in comfort. They don't want to lose <laughs> any of their lifestyle, even though they're hiding in the ground like a rat. I'm going to be just an ultra cynic here. It's the idea of extracting wealth from the people who are supporting the economy and then going underground with as much of that wealth as possible to live comfortably while everybody else kind of combusts on top. That's, that's the world goes crazy. I, I can see, I can see you and me out with some shovels trying to look for these things, you know, we'll kind of figure out where we think it might be, <laughs> you know, try to pry our way in there. That's, that's how the economy, <laughs> like that's the apocalypse when it happens from civil unrest. Everyone will be burning cities. You and I will be out in the desert with a couple of uh, metal detectors, just just asking to be let in. Just be like, "Hey, we will podcast <laughs> for you. Let us hang out on your bowling alley." Yeah. <laughs> Joe and I are a couple of cockroaches. I have a feeling we're going to be the last one standing <laughs> in this country. I was going to say us and Twinkies, but we already busted the Twinkie thing last week. On paper, we can't all be wealthy CEOs. Not when they make 350 times the salary of a worker. Not when stock buybacks and CEO pockets take precedence over strengthening American business. We're sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the economy just can't support any more arrested developments or successions. In fact, at those pay rates, not only can we not all be CEOs, but the 60% of teens who want to own their own businesses, won't be able to either. Nor can the 80 million people who bought the book Think and Grow Rich, or the 26 million who bought Rich Dad, Poor Dad. One estimate by Zipia puts the number of traditional company running CEOs at 39,000 scattered throughout the US. 39,000 in a country with over 30 million people. Not bad odds if you're a mega ball lottery player not great if you had your eye on a luxury bunker with a swimming pool. But hey, if you're listening to this podcast, your odds are already going up. You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback, and we love spirited debates. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. 